רדיו הבינתחומי. מאבא שש נקודה ארבע אפן. הרדיו החינוכי של המרכז הבינתחומי. Hi everyone, welcome to the IDC Radio 106.4. Here with me is Danielle Pletka, the Vice President of Foreign and Defense Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute. Danielle, welcome and thank you very much for being with us. I know you're a little jet lagged, so I appreciate it. Um, you're here today to address the question, can the world live with a nuclear Iran? So let's start with that, yes or no. Uh, can the world live with a nuclear Iran? Well, uh, uh, thank you, Anouk, for having me. It's a, really a pleasure to be here at Herzliya. Um, uh, the answer is, is, is that the question is, is a false one. Can the world uh, live with a nuclear Iran is not the right way to phrase it. It's will the world live with a nuclear Iran. And increasingly, I'm afraid that the world will be forced to, to, live, with, uh, to live with an Islamic Republic of Iran, i.e. the existing government, uh, with a nuclear weapons capability. I don't think that we are on track to stop it, and I don't think that the will exists. in the international community or in Washington, and I begin to suspect perhaps even not in Israel, to deal with the problem. Why do you think that is? I think that what we've seen historically, all we can look at is, is the evidence before us. And what we've seen is that successive Israeli and American governments, as well as other leaders, have said that a nuclear run is unacceptable. Uh, but the red lines have shifted constantly. So what we've heard from the beginning, and I've been working on this issue for many, many times, decades, I hate to say, um, is that, is that uh, first it was that Iran could not, uh, could not take certain steps in, in the conversion of uranium hexafluoride, then it couldn't take certain steps vis-a-vis -vis centrifuges, then it was a question of the threshold being that, uh, that Iran had the sufficient independent nuclear technology in order to create a cascade. We've passed every single red line. Uh, that uh, the international community, that the United States and Israel have set out uh, with no response. Uh, if I were an Iranian, I would think to myself that the world is bluffing. Uh, if you, I were an Iranian and I looked at North Korea, I would doubly think that the world is bluffing. That's the problem that I see. Well, a recent poll showed that yeah, one yeah. in six Iranians believe that the U.S. or Israel will attack Iran's nuclear facilities. That's only one in six Iranians. Uh, what odds would you place on an attack? I have no idea. I'm not, uh, I'm not privy to the decision-making uh, uh, inside the Israeli government or, frankly, inside this uh, American government. Uh, but I will say that I think that uh, not only uh, do Iranian nuclear uh, advances make it less likely that we would have an attack, uh, I think that they also make it less likely that we can have a successful attack. After all, our aim here is to ensure that Iran does not have a nuclear weapons capability not to uh, have you know any pleasure from from some sort of military action and uh, and so if that is our aim then I think we are receding from it if Iran acquires sufficient air defenses to be able to protect itself that further diminishes the ability of, of, of Israel and other countries to uh, execute a successful strike on Iran's nuclear capabilities despite the fact that it's being uh, said and seen that the Iranian people, don't like their government. Uh, the same poll that I talked about conducted in September 2010 by the International Peace Institute showed that 71% of Iranians want nuclear weapons compared with 52% in 2007. Does that indicate to you that sanctions have had a reverse effect and in a way entrenching the Iranian people in a, in a more hawkish position? No, I don't think that, that that's, uh, that's cause and effect. I think that uh, the Iranians, uh, and here we have to really say um, in many ways uh, uh, the Persians, um, uh, the Iranians' uh, gr grievances with their government uh, do not relate to the nuclear weapons program. They relate to tyranny, lack of human rights, lack of political, civil, and economic rights, and I would say if, if you had to pin it down that most Iranians are disgruntled with their government, not because of the pursuit of a nuclear weapons uh, program, but because uh, the uh, Ahmadinejad in particular, although his predecessors as well, have so royally screwed up the Iranian economy. There's just no more elegant way to put it. Uh, so I, I don't believe that to be the case. I also think that we need to recognize that uh, that that. 
consistently we have understood, not just from polls but from speaking to Iranians, that in fact they believe that they should have the right to a nuclear weapon should they want one. Our argument has to be very uh, serious. We don't want them to have nuclear weapons, but the most important thing we need to do is not want this government, this system in Iran to have nuclear weapons. We don't spend a lot of time talking about the Indian nuclear weapon program. We don't spend a lot of time talking about a possible Israeli nuclear weapons program. That is because we believe that these are responsible governments that are going to act carefully and steward any nuclear weapons capability they have very carefully. We do not believe that about this Iranian government. If there were a different one in place, it may be that the world would view the problem differently. Uh, following the, the recent Stuxnet virus believed to be prepared by the U.S. and Israel, uh, in your opinion, what impact will cyber warfare have going forward? Do you believe it has any, uh, it has any impact in this game? I think it does have an impact in the game. And again, I have no special privileged knowledge about Stuxnet, but I will say that uh, I will say that this is uh, an enormously sophisticated, clever, imaginative way forward. I do think that there's been more imagination brought to covert efforts to to destabilize the Iranian nuclear program. Um, the real question for us has to be whether they're going to be dispositive. Are they going to solve? the problem. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's great that we are bringing new efforts, new technology, new imagination to this challenge. I would be thrilled if we could do this with a program written in somebody's office rather than with a weapon designed in a factory. This would be uh, ideal from our standpoint. Um, I don't know that that's the case, but I think it's an important step forward. Uh, two things. I imagine to myself how great it would have been had we brought this imagination to bear when the problem began. Maybe the Iranian government wouldn't exist as it's currently constituted. Maybe they wouldn't have made so much progress towards a weapon. The second thing for us to remember is that cyber warfare is a two-way street. Okay. We use it, and the Iranians use it. They're not stupid. They're effective. They're capable. And they, too, can begin to try to destabilize our own systems, Israel, the United States, and others, through the same kind of cyber warfare with the help of Russia, with China, and with others. So in, in your personal opinion, uh, what measures would be most effective now to prevent a nuclear Iran? I know you don't uh, completely agree with what the Obama administration is doing. What else can be done uh, to prevent that? There's no silver bullet for the Iranian nuclear program. Uh, you know, as you, as you rightly pointed out, even if we were able to uh, help the Iranian people overthrow this system and put in place a new and a better system, that doesn't necessarily ensure that the nuclear uh, weapons program would be ended, although we, we would certainly uh, hope so. What we need is a, what we, what we need uh, short of military action, with the caveat that we don't even know that military action will solve such a problem. What we need is a whole series of policies that run in tandem, that are credible, that are effective, and that are thorough. We need a much more effective sanctions regime. We need much more effective enforcement of sanctions regime. We need a much more targeted approach to Iran's leadership. We don't have that in place right now. We need to go after individuals who are involved in the nuclear program. We already do that to a certain extent. But what about individuals involved in sponsorship of terrorism, individuals involved in violence against uh, the Iranian people and others? What about simply going after all members of the regime, as we indeed went after, for example, Saddam Hussein's regime? Then it is to have much more robust economic sanctions, visa sanctions. Then it is to have a much more aggressive covert program to destabilize. Then it is to absolutely make clear the consequences to those who continue to support the Iranians, either tacitly or explicitly, like China, like Russia, and like some Arab states, that in fact they do have to make a choice between Iran and doing business with the rest of the world. No one likes to hear that, but I think that we're at a point now where unless we are decisive, we are not going to achieve the traction that we want. It's great to say that the sanctions are starting to bite, but you know we are talking now about 15 years in. The Iran Libya Sanctions Act in the United States passed in 1996. Biting after 15 years is not much of a bite. Right. Uh, when you think about that lack of bite, do you think that military action, uh, in your personal opinion, is the most viable uh, solution now? 
I don't know. It's a completely, uh, completely honest and straightforward answer. I don't think that military action is a silver bullet, and I don't think that sanctions are a silver bullet. I think that military action affords us the opportunity, if, if it happens, to buy some additional time to begin to do things more decisively. But I fear the consequences. I know the Israeli government fears the consequences. I know the American one does, and I know that all of Iran's neighbors fear the consequences. We have allowed this to come to a terrible pass in which we have no good choices. If there were to be military action, uh, who should lead it? The UN, the US, Israel, the US and Israel together? Well, I mean, if we say the UN, we might as well also say Mickey Mouse. Uh, <laughs> that's not going to happen. Uh, I, I, that's, it's not my place to, to suggest to the government of Israel that it take military action against anybody. Um, I don't know whether, I, I don't know what, uh, I, don't, I don't know what's best. Um, part of the problem with the Iran challenge is that there are too many people uh, talking too much, knowing not enough, and too few people who have the capability making the kind of decisions, the hard decisions that need to be made. There are lots and lots of me. Uh, there aren't lots and lots of senior people in government who are being decisive enough to actually affect the change that we need to see. I have one more question. Uh, talking to Israelis and Americans, do you feel they are on the same page when it comes to Iran and what to do next? I think Israelis and Americans, uh, when you talk about the population, view Iran as a very, very serious threat that needs to be addressed. Um, do they agree about what should be done? Well, you just asked me, and I could barely agree with myself. Uh, so uh, I don't think that Israelis and Americans agree among themselves. Uh, I don't think that anyone agrees, because I don't think that there's a lot of certainty about what the right answer is. There is one thing in a democracy that you cannot live without, and that is leadership. You, know, you get elected to be president of the United States or prime minister of Israel to make the hard decisions, not just to have the nice house. And part of the problem that I see in the United States, and that's my country, so I feel more comfortable talking about it, is that we don't have sufficient leadership on this matter. The president has been willing to let this be a back burner issue. He has not used the platform of the presidency to lead the American people to a deeper understanding of the threat or to a deeper understanding of America's options. That's never a good thing from a president. I think President Bush deserves the same kind of criticism, and we need a leader who is actually going to, uh, who is going to take this process and begin to explain the challenge to the American people more clearly. Danielle, thank you so much for joining us on the IDC radio. That was Danielle Pletka of the American Enterprise Institute. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here.